So first of all, welcome to everybody that's here tonight. It's so great to see you, especially knowing what we're, what all of us are here uh, gathered for, and um, and what we're here to uh, to learn about. Which love this that you know it is absolutely true that knowledge ends extremism and extremism in all in all different forms. So it's great that you all made the effort to come out here um, to see our special guest. Um, who's come down all the way from, from New York to be here with us. So welcome to you all. Welcome to all of our VIPs that are here. So glad you all could join us um, this evening. Also want to thank the sponsors, Interfaith Forum and, and Upstate International. Anybody here from those two organizations that I haven't already met? So thank you so much um, for doing this for us and, and for gathering everybody here and making this possible. Also special thanks first and foremost to Ms. Daisy Khan. Thank you so much for being here. Daisy is the founder and executive director of Wise Up and uh, or Wise and the executive director or editor of the Wise Up Report, um, which is phenomenal. Um, I actually had the chance to to read part of this. This is the book. Look at how thick that is. Lots and lots of good knowledge in there, um, and very well put together. Um, I don't know if uh, I guess I should introduce myself as well. My name is Martine Wilder. I'm the Community Relations and Correspondence Director for your Greenville County Sheriff's Office. And for some of you who don't know, I'm also half Lebanese and was born in Beirut. And I also spent many years, in fact, up until three and a half years ago, I was in Lebanon for about nine years. So I understand very, very well um, how important it is to have knowledge of all the different groups that we live around. Lebanon is a country that's so tiny, but believe it or not, we have 18 different religious groups, 18, and we're this tiny little country. So people are like, well, how come Lebanon still exists? It exists because people know each other and their communication with one another and their ability to live with each other um, is based on everyone sharing humanity. And I think that, you know, just personally, um, I think that Lebanon is a great example of how groups can live very close together, be successful, um, and also how extremism can really threaten um, that very delicate balance, because I'm sure you all are not, uh, you know, um, I guess you'd say um, not ignorant of the fact that a lot of stuff goes on over there. So it is so important for people to make sure not to fall into um, judging each other out of ignorance or, or lack of knowledge or because of fear. And I think that that's what we're, we're really going to concentrate on tonight. And I know Daisy is going to highlight that and can't wait to, to talk more about that. So thanks again for all of you being here. Um, we are going to uh, now receive a wonderful, I'm sure, opening prayer from Reverend Steve Dowdy. May we pray together. O you who are perfect love, perfect justice, perfect care, and give within us all the yearnings for peace, shalom, shalem, salam, pacha, mereni, huping, mir. We give you thanks that in all our hearts and in all our languages, our yearning is one, as you are one enfolding us all. We give you thanks that through our yearning you have drawn us together. And together we pray your blessing on those who share tonight. We pray for the gift of your working within us all, so that as we listen, as we share, we may together be formed as you desire. And when we go forth from here, may we know that we are still held together, all of us, in you. And may we have the wisdom and the courage to share your ways of knowledge, peace, justice, love, wherever we go. We pray this with thanksgiving now for this special time. Amen. Thank you. 
And now I have the utmost pleasure of introducing a really phenomenal woman. I don't know if you all, any of you know her, but wish you, believe me, you need to get to know this lady. She is Marisa Barthel of the Atlantic Institute, and she is really the reason why we're here tonight. Her efforts um, in bringing all of this together and seeing that this is so important for us to be here. So, Marisa. Thank you. It's kind of hard to live up to something like that, but I'll try. It is my honor to be able to introduce Daisy Kahn tonight. I met Daisy in October when I traveled to Washington and attended the Wise Up Summit. And that was when the world was introduced to the Wise Up Movement and Report. And as I sat in the audience that day, I was truly intrigued, not only by the content of the book, but by the premise. And the premise, as you'll see on the cover, is that knowledge ends extremism. Let me explain. For my career, I spent over 30 years in the US intelligence community. And while I was there, I literally was involved in some very, you could say, non-traditional interfaith and intercultural work, where I was working shoulder to shoulder with my contacts around the world. And we succeeded in our efforts going after targets of mutual interest, not in spite of our differences, but because of them. And for the last 12 years of my career, my focus was extremism, and I literally, again, was working with my colleagues around the world fighting extremists. And as we worked together, again, our differences were what made us stronger. And this is what I know for sure from my background working the extremist target, is that we're not going to end the war on terrorism or the war against extremists in whatever form they might be, by bombs or boots on the ground or bullets. And we're always gonna need intelligence services to be out there collecting intelligence on the bad guys, who they are, what their plans are, and we're always gonna need law enforcement detaining these bad guys. But we are only going to eradicate this world of extremism if we change hearts and minds. And that's why this particular report is something that intrigues me so much. It allows us in our community to address the unfounded fears regarding Islam and Muslims, which is something that's needed. But more importantly, it provides practical information that all of us across the community can use to proactively, instead of reactively, start dealing with bullying and hate crimes. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to Mrs. Daisy Khan. Thank you, Daisy, for bringing us this. Thank you for coming to Greenville and for your leadership in this particular effort. As Martine mentioned, Daisy is not only the executive editor of the Wise Up Report, but she is the founder and executive director of WISE, which is the Women's Islamic Initiative for Spirituality and Equality. Before this, she served as the executive director of the American Society for Muslim Achievement where she spent 18 years creating groundbreaking intra and interfaith programs. She lectures in the US and internationally on a number of target, uh, topics to include Muslim women, Islam in America, Islamophobia, and violent extremism. And if her name is familiar or her face is familiar to you, it's because she regularly appears on CNN, MSNBC, and ABC and she's frequently quoted in print media to include Time Magazine and the New York Times. Ladies and gentlemen, Daisy Kahn. Thank you, Marissa, for this kind invitation. Is there any feedback? Okay. Um, I do want to thank the Interfaith Forum, uh, the Upstate International, I think it's called Upstate International, where I was this afternoon, and Atlantic Institute for this kind invitation and for your sponsorship. I begin in the name of the one God, uh, whom we all worship in different languages and in different ways, the God of Abraham, the God of Adam, Noah, Moses, Muhammad, 
and Jesus. And today I stand before you as a woman, a Muslim woman, who is also an American and who, uh, you know, took the oath of citizenship willingly and lovingly. And so this land is also my adopted land. And um, the topic of discussion today is very dear to me uh, because I, it uh, is something that has affected me personally. And uh, the reason why Wise Up has been created is because since 9-11 I have been struggling to figure out what is the right solution for us to move beyond uh, the division and the despair uh, that I find in my community and especially now when our nation seems to be so deeply polarized. A little bit about myself personally. Uh, I came to this country at the age of 15 from Kashmir. It's also another disputed land where two nuclear nations are fighting over this little piece of real estate. And uh, I came to America, and uh, although I was born in Kashmir, 100% Muslim family, I was sent to Catholic school. So I did the Lord's Prayer 3,000 times. Those of you who are former Catholics can, uh, uh, but of course, you know, um, we, we were taught by missionary nuns. Most of the students were non-Christians. Were non and uh, my teachers were Hindu. My professors were uh, of different, you know, religions. I played, uh, climbed mountains with uh, Sikh girls and what freshwater girls with Buddhists. And this was the worldview that I grew up in. And then we were always told that we were from the lost tenth tribe of Israel. And at the age of fifteen, when I came to America, ironically, I landed in Jericho, a hundred percent Jewish neighborhood. <laughs> So my religious education was complete in the sense that I had intersected with every major world religion at a very young age. That is what I thought the world was like. And to me, that harmony and celebrating different religions and, and understanding them and respecting them was the way. It was norm. And then years later, as I began my career, I became an architectural designer, I had a full-fledged career of 25 years. And then I married an imam, and that's another story. You guys can buy my memoir for that. Uh, coming out soon, by the way. Uh, but really, it was divine intervention. I don't know, I didn't understand why I was married to an imam at that time, but now, when I look back, uh, I uh, you know, was supposed to be do doing this work. And then 9-11 happened, the towers fell. And prior to that, I had worked in the towers for three years. I had intimate knowledge of the neighborhood, of the little shops that we bought food from, the places that we ate lunch at, every person who was in the towers. So this was not just some event that happened over there. It was our neighborhood, my office building, my neighborhood, a place where my husband worshiped. And it was, the attack was done by a people that professed to do it in, my, in the name of my religion. And I was wife of an imam, and I had gone back to my religion with a very difficult spiritual journey and I knew that if I didn't do something about it, that it was going to affect my own personal uh, identity as a Muslim. So with that, I have been trying to find a solution. And in 2010, my husband and I proposed a community center. Many of you heard about it. It was called the Ground Zero Mosque. It was neither at Ground Zero nor was it a mosque. It was a community center, cooking classes, gymnasium, you know, art center, the kinds of things that every community dreams of. And then uh, the attackers came out of nowhere. And the thing that hurt the most was not that they were fearful or that they had been, they had consumed wrong information, was when they said, not you, not here, not now. And that hurt because I consider myself to be a real patriot. I love this country, I adopted it, and I'd do anything to defend it and its values. So with that, we realized that we had a much bigger challenge. And of course, since then, we have seen hate crimes rise. We have seen, you know, a lot of Islamophobic machinery unfolding in this country. And so we were maybe the first ones that were symbolic targets, and then this has spread all over the nation, and many other communities under, under duress as well. So this is the reason I'm doing this. It's not just because I wanted to print a lovely book. This is a lot of work. 
But really, we're trying to find a solution for this problem and a long-term solution. So with that, we set out to, uh, in my opinion, after 9-11, all the outreach that I had done, and I sat with many audiences like this, the only way I was able to communicate with people and change their hearts and minds was to provide them with the right knowledge. And that is what I believe fundamentally needs to be, ne needs to be done now, and this is why we think that knowledge is the most important tool. The press always plays a major role in shaping perception, as many of you know, which leads to the public having this negative perception of Islam and Muslims, which eventually winds up shaping policy, and then governments legislating laws based on misinformation about Islam and Muslims. And the result is rampant Islamophobia, increase in hate crimes by 67%, Muslim ban and anti-Sharia legislation, and a ripe environment for extremist recruitment. What is Islamophobia? It's anti-Muslim racism, hostility towards Islam, unfair discrimination against Muslims, exclusion of Muslims from political and social affairs. And this is why we, the social affairs, you know, for us to build a community center was part of us stating ourselves as American Muslims in this country, like a JCC, a YMCA. And they said, no, not right now, you're not, you're not going to do it here. What is violent extremism? Individuals who get indoctrinated in extreme views, sometimes with overtly ideological messages, who use violence and engage in unlawful activities, including terror, to attain their social, political, and economic goals. How do we address these issues? Accurate information about who American Muslims are and what they believe. And it's not something that is like an idea. It's many of these people are your neighbors. They are, I met with Chief Miller this morning, they are your citizens. They are the people that you have to safeguard. They are taxpayers. So to introduce Wise Up, how did we do this project? We, we knew that we had to solve many problems and I myself could not really write this entire manual. So I invited people with the right expertise and we ironically wound up with 72 contributors. Many of you have heard of 72 virgins. Well, we actually got 72 voices instead of that. So uh, it's 375 pages. As one uh, politician recently told us, he said, a page a day will keep the extremists away. I'm going to keep this next to my night table, and every night I'll read a page, and by the end of the year, I would have accomplished my goal. It's in three sections, and each section is geared to First section, to provide accurate information about Islam and Muslims, to correct misinformation, and that is giving voice to American Muslims. Sorry. So the kind of stuff that you will see in here is to trace back the history of Islam in America. So going all the way back to Islam, Thomas Jefferson, and the First Amendment. And the kinds of things that, you, that we wanted to highlight was Islam has always been part of America. Starting in colonial times, many of the slaves brought here were from Africa, and even in their bondage, some kept their faith alive. Thomas Jefferson explained that the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, he wrote, was designed to protect all faiths, which include the Jew, the Gentile, the Christian, and the Muslim. So people who say that Islam is not an American religion, we want to remind people that it is. Then goal two is to offer practical ways to counter Islamophobia and extremism. And we do that by comparing Islamic theology versus extremist ideology because it's very important for us now to delink the two or to separate the two. And we do that by just showing you literally what is fake and what is true. We show you the definitions, how, what the prophet said about this particular issue. We even have a Quranic verse. And then with fake, which is really ISIS's ideology, we show you the dogma and the propaganda. Goal three is to equip parents and institutions, community leaders such as yourselves with the skills and knowledge to rapidly respond to incidences of extremist recruitment or anti-Muslim bias because it's written for both audiences. And so we have a section called preventing extremist recruitment. So in this case, for instance, you would have a religious counselor's intervention, early intervention. Now, why am I showing you this? Because I'm using this particular thing with incarcerated individuals in the New York area. I'm actually using this template to go in there and to speak to them in such a way so that we can 
show them that the knowledge that we have about extremist ideology, it's really important to understand what it is because many Muslims and non-Muslims don't know what this ideology is. So today you will actually see it for yourself. We become aware of various psychological, social, and political conditions that may be affecting the psychology of the counseling. So it's not only about ideology, a lot of it is also about psychology of the person and what is happening in their lives. And then leave a lasting impact on the minds of the counselees so that these incarcerated individuals, when they eventually come out, are transformed human beings. So part one, to go a little, delve it, a little bit more into detail, why did we do a community-led response? Why didn't we just rely on law enforcement or intel or military? You know, most of the time, people will tell you that counterterrorism is done by military operations, curbing the finances, law enforcement, and intel. These are the four approaches that people use. But as Marissa said, we can't use bombs and sanctions and drones because they don't really work in the, in the long term. So the community response was we actually polled the Muslim community and we asked them over the next five years, please rate how much emphasis should be placed on the following counter-extremism efforts. And you can see community engagement is the highest. And then the lowest is the military. They actually said, please stop the military operations because they're having an adverse effect. They wanted to focus on community engagement. We also included the seven common misconceptions that people have about Muslims. And I will go through each one of these separately. Just we have seven, but First one, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. You hear this from everybody. But the truth is violent extremism dropped by 40% in 2016 as compared to 2015, while self-identifying Muslims are responsible for 123 fatalities since 9-11. More than 230,000 Americans were murdered over the same period. Muslims are not patriotic. Almost 4,000 Muslims serve in the US Armed Forces. And there are 900 Muslim New York Police Department employees. I know a lot of Muslim cops that are there. Muslims are responsible for most acts of terrorism in the US. From 1980 to 2005, American Muslims were responsible for only 6% of the attacks in the US. And law enforcement agencies consider anti-government violent extremists as the most severe threat to the nation. And finally, Muslims aren't doing anything to prevent violent extremism. You've heard this all the time. Where are the Muslims and why don't they speak out? So actually, this is the biggest speaking out that we're doing. We brought all these voices together. So American Muslims are the single largest source of tips to the law enforcement agencies in foiling terrorist plots. This is a fact. Muslims have issued countless condemnations against terrorism since 9-11. And we included in Wise Up for more than 1,400 condemnations on the website. If you go there, you can download an Excel spreadsheet. I had a gentleman who's writing a book about religions in America, and he didn't have this information. And when I sent him, the, uh, sent him the link, he was floored because all he had said in his book was, oh, they've issued some condemnations, and he had no idea that this level of condemnations were out there. So the second question we asked Muslims as we were polling them, as a Muslim, which of the following labels for the so-called Islamic State would you recommend for use in the mainstream media? Because we know that Muslims don't want the linking of Islam and terrorism because it adversely affects the community. So they came up with the Arabic name Daesh as the preferred name, which is the original name that they gave themselves, and other as second. And you can see all others, Islamic State, ISIL, ISIS, Islamic State acronym are like 1.69%. So Muslims don't want the, the, the name Islam associated with terrorism. And so they're asking people to kindly refrain from using that because you know, it affects our community. But what is Daesh? Daesh in Arabic means al dawlat al-Islami al-Iraq al-Shams. ISIS hates to be called Daesh, which means one who crushes something under their foot and is translated as one who sows discord. So they actually don't even prefer that, although they are the ones who came up with that. Why do we need to delink Islam from terrorism? Because terrorists use Islam as a veneer so they can validate their actions, reinforce their recruitment practices. And linking terrorism to Islam provides them false legitimacy for their violent act tactics and hinders efforts to counter their extremist ideology. Part two, extremist Islamic theology versus extremist ideology. 
this is one of the most comprehensive sections that has everything you want to know about Islam. I'm only going to give you a couple of highlights here because we don't have time to go into everything. For instance, we start with why does Daesh distort Islam? Uh, because Daesh ideology provides a, this, this ideology provides a language of mass mobilization. It's easy to rally people when you say you're doing this for the sake of the, the greater good, something bigger than yourself. Uh, Daesh ideology provides justification for acts of violence. Uh, Daesh ideology sustains a culture of violence for future generation. And this ideology provides rationale for finance and logistical support. Now, some of this stuff is, is a little bit um, dated because they have uh, been you know, eliminated. They're, they are no longer have the territory. But this thing is now residing online. So this is why we are still focused on making people aware. Uh, eight Quranic concepts that they distort, and this is very interesting because many Muslims don't even know how they do the distortion, but uh, for instance, a term called al-wala wal bara which means loyalty and disavowal, is meant to reject those who are not with them and form their us versus them mentality. Now this us versus them mentality is the same mentality that exists in every extremist group. So even white nationalists will say the same thing. So every extremist group has the same thinking. We are the right ones and everybody else is wrong. They consider themselves to be the rightly guided ummah and defenders of faith as the jama'ah, a group commonly used for congregational prayer. They claim to represent the global Muslim majority. They label others as kufar, unbelievers, and declare takfir, excommunication, to justify the murder of innocent civilians. They demand bayah, allegiance. You've heard this many times that somebody was about to go do some killing spree and then they take allegiance to ISIS and, uh, and the group's doctrine. They limit jihad, struggle to be in holy war in order to fight the enemy and justify the killing. And they call on Muslims to make a hijra for their, from their impure environments and to live with, live with true Muslims like themselves. And they ask followers to become shaheed martyr by committing suicide. And then they invite Muslims from all over the world to populate their caliphate, which will usher in the golden age. And you can see this utopia has not materialized because it was only short-lived. This is how we do the comparison for those people who want to be educated and have information readily available. So the, uh, the, green, uh, the gray box shows you the term. The uh, yellow shows you the true Islamic definition. Uh, the fake teaching is ISIS's definition. And I call this the cheat sheet. Uh, you can have this on your phone at all times, and if you're having a little conversation with a friend who does not understand anything, you can just pull these terms up and say, I know better. This is how we do a longer description. I showed you this before. And then we actually give you something even more if you're more intellectually inclined, or you're a professor, or you're a religion you know, major, or you, are, it, it, you know, want to do real study. We give you a real article to read, which is written by a scholar. And for instance, in the Lesser Jihad and the Prohibition of Terrorism, this is what our article says. You may not kill non-combatants and civilians of any kind, may not arbitrarily destroy property, may not uproot trees, may not kill people who are wounded or fleeing, may not poison the water wells, may not commit suicide, may not engage in terrorism, may not engage in cheating and treachery, may not commit rape, may not terrorize people, may not torture any people or animals may not wage war against fellow Muslims. This is the hallmark. Although these are the prohibitions, this is the hallmark of terrorists. And this is why every Muslim will tell you they are not Muslim, or they are not doing anything that's Islamic. And now you have it right in front of you. How do they violate Islam? In the values, through the values of Islam. They dehumanize non-Muslims. And Islam teaches that God has conferred dignity upon all human beings. We are all children of Adam, not just Muslims. That's it. That's what the Quran says. Excommunication of Muslims. Islam forbids self-righteousness, contempt, or judging another human being. Indiscriminate violence. Islam teaches that killing one person is like killing all of humanity. This is also in the Torah, as we know. Building a utopian caliphate, Islam does not dictate that Muslims form a caliphate. Leaders are seen as representatives and servants of people and must be chosen by consent. Persecution of other religions, you've heard this in many Christians complain about 
persecution of Christians in certain communities. Islam protects freedom of religion and forbids oppression and coercion. Muslims are taught that true worship of God entails kindness to all of humanity. Reinstitute of slavery to usher in the end of times. You remember when they were enslaving people recently? Bringing back slavery. Islam calls for freeing slaves and makes enslavement a crime. Muslims believe that it's not possible for humans to usher in the end of time. And declaring war against all. Islam forbids fighting against those who offer peace. And Muslims are only permitted to fight in self-defense and not become aggressors. And finally, murder of innocent civilians as revenge for civilians killed during foreign invasions. This is a very big one because they will show pictures of images of wars that have, you know, been where Western allies have, have killed innocent people. But Islam forbids killing of innocent civilians and commands the protection of all. Islam teaches that no human being is responsible for the crime of another. So you can only defend yourself. You're not supposed to go in there and fight on behalf of other people. Then there are five Quranic verses that they commonly take out of context. And this is something that when most, you know, these are Quranic verses that even I sometimes get from people saying, well, why does the Quran say kill them where you find them? Well, it's only a piece of, 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 the, of, the, of the verse. It's not the whole verse. And even then, many of you know that scripture are all you know, in, in the context of, uh, in always revealed in the context of their time and the society. So here's what the real thing says. This verse refers to the Quraysh, who were the enemies who used to torture Muslims. And the verse before that says, fight in the cause of God against those who fight you and do not commit aggression. And the verse after this one says, if they cease fighting, then let there be no hostility except against oppressors. The verse means do not attack women, children, elderly, or anyone who is not fighting you. Then the second verse, when you meet disbelievers, smite their necks. This is another one that they use. This misquote is ridiculous. It is not a continuous command towards all disbelievers at all times. Rather, it refers to those who were attacking Muslims in war at that time in 7th century Arabia. A better translation of this verse is when you meet disbelievers, that is, means rejectors of God, who are fighting you in battle, strike at their necks to crush them, meaning like this, try to bring them, like try to, you know, when you have overwhelmed them, defeated them, tighten their bonds, make them prisoner, like, you know, put the handcuffs, they didn't have handcuffs in those days, then free them graciously or hold them for ransom until the war lays down its burdens, war ceases or victory is achieved. So this is how you treat people who are potential prisoners. Then, of course, the one thing that we have continuously heard about is Sharia. What is Sharia? And many people ask about that. So we laid out this beautiful honeycomb for you to see what are the objectives of Islamic law. So what does it actually say? The objective of Islamic law is to help realize the best interests of human beings, including the protection and promotion of six rights of all human beings. Life, mind, religion, family, lineage, wealth, and dignity. And some people say that this is life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Because if you have all these, you have the life, the liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The concept of al adamiyah where I mentioned earlier that we're all children of Adam, uh, and the concept of human dignity conferred upon all children of Adam are considered to be comparable to natural rights and human rights. And so people are granted rights and protections by virtue of their humanity rather than their belief in Islam. So life means the right to life, personal liberty, freedom from arbitrary arrest, torture, national security, provision of food, shelter, clothing, opportunities to work, health care, quality, protection of environment, including flora and fauna. Now, I don't have time to go through each one of them, but let's just say, what does it say about religion? Protection and promotion of the moral and spiritual values of religion, facilitation and realization of commanding the good and forbidding the evil, in order to promote and protect the moral fabric of society, freedom of independent legal reasoning is to have by competent, qualified, and knowledgeable individuals, promoting harmony and good relations among followers of all religions. Protection of religious freedom for other belief systems. Protect prohibition of the desecration of religious and religious symbols. This is very important. This is what this is what our law says. And there is so so much violation of this law going on all over. So I can go on and on, but I don't think we have enough time. 
So we will go to part three now, preventing extremist recruitment. How do we do this? Uh, many Americans will tell you that the reason why people join ISIS is because they hate our freedoms. Don't you hear that all the time? They hate our freedoms? Well, it's nowhere here. It's not a push. In all the research that we have done, it's not there. Some people are seeking a spiritual path, and the, the pull on this side, sorry, I think. Um, so this is the push factor. This, these are the reasons, the discontent that individuals have in their lives. And the pull factor is the invitation from the other side. So if you were, you know, it's similar to what gangs would do. It's similar to other cult groups and other people who say, we have the answers, we are your savior, so come and join us. So somebody who's seeking a spiritual path, they claim to be one true Islam, that we have the truth and you can come and join us. If somebody has a bleak future outlook, like a lot of people in the Middle East, they don't have jobs, there's a job waiting here for you. I have one incarcerated individual in New York. She was looking for a job. She said, I, I was told that I would go there and I would have housing and a job. Uh, suffering and injustice in the Muslim world, this is something that they heavily bombard you with this emotion show you images of all the atrocities, the refugees, the kind of stuff that even we get so sick when we see. And then they say, you, you can bring justice and honor back to Muslims and to Islam by joining us. Uh, us against the rest of the world offer empowerment through successful resistance. Uh, if you are disaffected by the political status quo in your country, which many Muslim countries people are disaffected with the status quo, this is your chance to create a political, a, a brand new political system. Marginalization and alienation, this is, this is really geared to the Western audience. Uh, promise of uh, companionship, brotherhood, and sisterhood. Because, you know, uh, when you come to us and our land, you will be treated as an equal, you will not be treated inferior. Disconnect from Western culture. Some people who cannot reconcile Western values with their own values, then they feel that there's an opportunity for them to lead a purer life. And you know, you hear a lot about purity, even with the white nationalists here. We want to return to our own purity. All the immigrants are adulterating the system. Well, it's a similar idea here: is that we have to maintain purity. And uh, uh, poor examples of glory, heroism, and importance. There are nobody, no heroes to look up to. So the other side, heroism is important, and it's your chance to be a hero. So it's a very strong pull for somebody who has nothing going on in their life, and they're being told that if you join us, you will become the hero. Uh, what are the vulnerability factors that uh, make a person vulnerable to this? This, by the way, is something that you can use for gangs, you can use for anybody. This is nothing to do with just ISIS, this is uh, across the board. But external factors, which, you know, there are a lot of internal factors like relational, social identity, psychology, and personal, but external factors are very key and they can be prevented. Uh, polarized and polarizing societal debates, government positioning on poorly understood national and international issues, highly sensationalized public, and media discourse, extremist discourse, and propaganda that is readily available. So for instance, YouTube has been you know, spreading this stuff and recommending videos. Just if you search jihad, they'll give you so many other videos that the algorithm will just send you the stuff. You may not even be looking for the stuff, but all of a sudden, you, you are being given this, these brand new videos to watch. So that's one way that you can stop that. And recently, uh, YouTube has been taking down a lot of videos but highly sensationalized public and media discourse. When Donald Trump says something like, you know, Islam hates us, it's right up there as a recruiting thing. And uh, so anyway, these are some of them. Protective factors are the exact opposite of that. So, you know, with external, you would create a presence of counter-extremist discourse in general society, which is what we, want, we are focusing on right now. We create an open societal debate advocating tolerance, respect, and integration. Uh, reinforcement of the principles of shared community and collective resist, uh, resilience against hateful ideologues and hate speech. Uh, so how do we, uh, then we also have some uh, specific tools for how to counter hate speech. And this is written by a veteran, so not everybody in this in this book is a Muslim contributor, so we have actually reached out to non-Muslims to help us write. They are the best people who have done a lot of research and are dedicated to this. So, you know, consider the person's emotions. Remember that changing beliefs is hard. Respect that people have sticky identities. Combat misinformation and acknowledge the impact of social norms. 
this is this is worth a lot. This is an excellent article and a real tool for anybody who wants to get out into opposition communities who really don't understand you and to use this template and to try it in your own communities. Uh, five Ds of bystander intervention. There were these three kids in Portland uh, that tried to intervene to stop uh, harassment of, of a Muslim woman and two of them got killed because they didn't know how to do bystander intervention. And so how do you do effective bystander intervention and, and not put yourself at harm's way? So there's a whole thing of distract, delay, direct intervention, delegate and document, and there's more to it. So this is just one, uh, one thing that I'm showing you. So wise up uh, in general, uh, this is just a snapshot of what I, uh, what's in the book, but there's, like I said, 375 pages. I can't go through all of them, but it's just a little snippet of it. But it is considered to be, many people who have seen it, have read it, considered to be thoroughly authoritative and much needed overview. Uh, it will be useful to Muslims, Christians, and Jews. It's a perfect book for adult study in a religious setting, in a mosque, a church, a synagogue, or a public forum like this. Uh, who has endorsed it? 50 interfaith organizations, 100 mosques, and civic organizations. And who will use Wise Up? The general public, elected officials. Love it, because they have everything in one place now. Clergy and activists, sorry, clergy and activists, social workers and parents, media influencers, and special interest groups. We launched in DC, as Marissa said. This is what our launch looked like. It was a very impressive array of government people, local religious leaders, activists, all came together. Uh, what's next for us? We are doing uh, town hall dialogues. This is one of those dialogues. We're doing government outreach, online educational outreach, community resiliency trainings, and impacting public opinion. Town hall dialogues are here. Uh, you are not here yet. I don't think you've made it on the, on, on the, on, on the map yet, but, but this is what, we, uh, what we're doing here today. Uh, government outreach is going to be a congressional briefing in a couple of months. Educational outreach is going to be a lot of trainings. Community resiliency, more, uh, sorry, the previous one was curriculums, this is trainings. And uh, impact public opinion, books are going to people who are important in the influential areas like media and government. So this is Ali Belshi, he is on MSNBC, some of you may know him, and he said it will change the way media reports on Islam because oftentimes media folks don't have the time to do research and they don't know how to, how to report on these things. So then we end, uh, in, in, we try to keep America great and guess who's doing it? It's Muslims. I have to make a plug for my community. Um, so let me show you how we are keeping America great. Um, so this is, we chose 35 notable American Muslims who are contributing to the fabric of America every single day, and you probably don't know who they are. Anybody? I need IT help.
not Hillary. And that's how we keep America great, by just doing our work and using our skill and our talent and giving back to community. So now I would like to um, invite Chief Miller and the Sheriff's representative to accept uh, our little gift of the Wise Up book. This is a special gift for you. I know you'll do amazing, amazing, amazing things with this book. If you'd like to say a few words, you can. Sure. First of all, thank you. Thank you for taking time with us today. Uh, so we met earlier this morning uh, at, at uh, police headquarters uh, to learn a little bit more about the Wise Up movement and to talk about the police role here locally uh, and how we can connect and uh, learn and really just uh, open up uh, so that we can provide the kind of assistance that we need to on the safety and security for all uh, in our community. So um, I'm grateful uh, for your effort, for your effort to, uh, to help educate um, Americans all across our country and in particular police. And I, you know, the, the, she said earlier on that she works with NYPD, but she's worked with NYPD since 2010, I believe, mm -hmm. is what she told us. And, um, and that work is important. And if you know anything about uh, NYPD's efforts, uh, the New York uh, local government, New York, didn't trust federal government to actually protect its, its city. Uh, and so they made substantial investments uh, in the police department to uh, to try and protect the city. Uh, but at, in doing that, they found themselves isolating uh, the department from uh, the Islamic community. And so the outreach efforts that began in the, in the late 2000s, the latter part of the last decade, really resulted in a, uh, a team effort, which Daisy was a, a part of, to help the New York Police Department uh, retool its approach uh, to providing and protecting uh, the people it serves, all the people it serves. So I am grateful to you, you. Uh, for your effort. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now we'd like to invite a representative from the sheriff's office. Oh, look who the representative is. <laughs> Martine. <laughs> Thanks. Where's your sheriff badge? Yes, I know my sheriff's badge. So I, I humbly accept this on behalf of Sheriff Will Lewis and um, and I just want to say that it was a very important for him to make the office of the sheriff. I don't know if you all are aware but that office of the sheriff did not exist prior to this administration and that office of the sheriff is dedicated solely to community relations, community outreach, community dialogue. So I was very thankful um, when I came to them to ask permission to, um, to benefit from this opportunity that had been offered to me um, to emcee this event, um, which puts the Greenville County Sheriff's Office in a, in a prominent position um, for this discussion and this presentation, I was very thankful that they were very positive about that and welcomed me to do that. Um, sorry that they couldn't be in, that he could not be here um, this evening, but I am very thankful to accept that on his behalf, and I'll probably be the one who's reading it along with him too. So, <laughs> thank you. So I think that 
I think we agreed that Muslims and non-Muslims need to do this together. I know we can't do this by ourselves. We've created a toolkit, but we need all of you. So I would like to invite the panelists who are going to have this discussion on how we can work together. Uh, Rabbi Matthew Marco, um, Father Michael uh, Flanagan, and Dr. Akif Aydin, if you can please come up on stage. <clears throat> Um, and just for, just for some further clarification as well about this distinguished panel, in case you do not know the members here, we've got Father Mike Flanagan from Holy Cross Episcopal Church, and Rabbi Matthew Marco, who is from Congregation Beth Israel, and Akif Aydin, Turkish American Muslim instructor at Furman, um, OLLI on Islamic Studies, and President of the Atlantic Institutes. Well, I. I think the reason I got here is because I told a story a, a little bit ago um, where we had uh, we had a Ramadan dinner at our church and uh, one of my members came up and said to me, why are you inviting people here that want to kill us? And I said, that's not who's coming. Um, <laughs> exactly. Daesh. <laughs> so there, there's just a, a pretty wide misunderstanding. I know when Akif came, there was one was another, me. Uh, one, another, <laughs> another gentleman who uh, started a series of questions that we sort of shut him down before he got to the end. But um, he came to me later and sat down with me and said, you know, I wanted to get to the point where I could ask him, well, do you consider us all to be infidels and doesn't your Quran say that we should kill all the infidels? Um, so that misunderstanding is out there a lot as well. And um, the opportunity to work with the Atlantic Institute has been really helpful for us because um, one of, another one of my members was overjoyed when she ran into one of the folks that she had met at one of the dinners at the Atlantic Institute and was able to be able to hang out in the Bilo grocery store with her Muslim friend. Excellent. <laughs> Which was really Excellent. a wonderful opportunity to say, I, I know this person and um, I trust them and I like them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, interfaith dialogues have been a, a big interest of mine for years. When, when I was in seminary, uh, each year we did an inter-seminary retreat uh, from various faiths. Um, but when I, when I was hired to come to Greenville, I get an email that was forwarded from my office from Akif and Christina about the, uh, the tour of fates. This was a couple of years ago, asking if we would like to participate in it. And I jumped all over. I said, this you know, didn't even have my job yet. I hadn't even gotten here, but I said, this is very important. And when I got here from California, I think it was my second uh, Sabbath that I was here. I, I was talking it up. I wanted the people to come. And maybe I was a little too California because I, I said, well, you know, our father is Abraham, and, and our Muslim brothers and sisters, their father is Abraham, and Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and Ishmael is the father of the Muslim people, and Isaac is the father of our people. That makes us cousins. Well, for the most part, that fell on very good ears, but there were a couple of years that we're not so happy about that. Um, and this is a similar thing um, but that one of the gentlemen in, in my congregation uh, was a first responder in 9-11, and lost a lot of friends and is still not been able to reconcile that. So he comes up to me asked her afterwards and he says, Rabbi, they're not my friends, they're not my cousins, I will be here for you. Now, um, you probably don't realize, Dr. Ahmed, you were actually, he said, and he said, I won't talk to them. You might not realize it, but you were sitting at a table with them talking and eating after that service. So and I looked over and I went, all right, well that's cool. He realized that it's just another person. Um, I think when, when we get to know one another, the more we learn about one another, the more we realize that our differences are truly an illusion, uh, that we share more in common than we, than we have even close to being apart, and talking and sitting down and breaking bread is, is the way to make that happen. Well said. Thank you, everybody. First of all, let me again thank uh, Daisy Khan for her wonderful presentation, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mike and Rabbi Marco. I feel kind of guilty for two things. One, actually, as part of my teaching, I'm always being asked, why do Muslims really not speak up and really do more events and kind of educate the community? 
And when we, as a Muslim, try to reach out, now we are feeling again guilty why we are reaching out, you know, <laughs> as if we are going to kill them just to open my uh, mindset. Uh, so, can, I think the interfaith is very important and essential. I have been in Greenville uh, in my last eight years, and uh, I have seen the city is growing very well and being more diverse, and I see the need uh, and importance of dialogue, interfaith activities, intercultural activities. Uh, so being more diverse community and uh, naturally uh, kind of we, we might really suspect from one another if we do not get along together, if we do not educate each other. Uh, so from the Muslim's perspective, definitely this is one of the, you know, Islam unfortunately is one of the most misunderstood faiths in the United States. And uh, I believe uh, all Muslims and non-Muslims equally have to spend efforts uh, and time uh, to really eliminate this misunderstanding. Therefore, this Wise Up report is a great resource. Uh, I believe it's going to help for each and every one, first of all, to educate his and her staff, and also to be used for different purposes and educate different you know, communities. Uh, so, at the Atlantic Institute, we try to do our humble share uh, to be very active in the community. And in the beginning of actually tonight, I was told those people are here. They are the one already believe in this, you know, values. We need to reach out to others who really do not uh, feel more comfortable, like the one really uh, kind of hate, unfortunately, from the other sides, regardless, let them to be Muslims or, you know, or Jews or, you know maybe the other faith community members. So I think once we get together, uh, I kind of give, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, like I love to visit uh, different churches on Sundays. As a Muslim, uh, I go to mosque on Fridays. Sometimes when I'm asked on Sundays, I tell, now I'm in the, you know, I'm at a church. So now they tell, you kind of take advantage of both faiths. <laughs> so now, uh, on Fridays go to mosque, on Sundays go to churches, because I really feel that by joining another faith community services to observe and engage in what they do is very powerful and important. And therefore I encourage all the other Muslims too, to reach out, to go there. If they live in a neighborhood, they have a next door church, go and just join their Sunday services. Learn about what, how they are worshiping, what they believe in. That's very important. I personally visited three churches next to my home. And I kind of really feel this is very important because that is what the concept of the neighborhood, right? So I try to humbly really practice that one and also I encourage you know, everyone to do the same thing. Uh, so definitely interfaith and intercultural activity is very important. Yes, um, I absolutely, absolutely believe that that's true. Um, and we were actually talking previous to this whole thing, you know, actually getting underway. And we said, you know, this crowd is really good. It was better than we had expected it to be. And I think that it, was, it says a lot about you all that are here. That you decided that this was important enough for you to be able, you know, to spend your evening, which I'm sure you're tired, you've probably worked and been busy today, but to spend part of your evening learning, um, getting to know um, about WISE and about WISE UP and, and, and being curious about it because as we all know, and I, and I often talk, and I'm sure that you, you all also um, have these conversations at the police department, is that Greenville County is becoming more diverse demographically whether people like it or not. <laughs> it just is. And so if we as public servants are gonna truly serve the public, then we should understand the people that we serve. Would you not agree to that? Um, and, and I think that that is, that is for, for me, as, as, you know, as a community relations person for the sheriff's office, I care. I care to know if, if a certain section of, the, of our community feels underserved or feels wrongly treated or feels misrepresented or, or misunderstood. It matters to me. Um, and I think that that, I, I really appreciate the fact of that every one of you here um, really hit on the point of just misunderstanding and the fact that fear is really the controller. And so how can you fight fear if you're ignorant of the facts or you're being told lies? So you have to educate yourself. Um, so I guess what I would love to ask you um, is seeing 
or understanding or seeing a little bit, you know, and, or knowing upstate South Carolina, um, and, and knowing the, the, the temperament of your congregation or the people that you associate with, what do you think, um, or what kind of advice would you give to people to trying to really open up the conversation, if you would? I can't help but think of what Jesus said, which he, <laughs> when they said, where, where, where do you stay? And he said, come and see. Um, and I think that's really, I think that's really the key. Come and see. Um, that's the, as far as I know, that's the only way that we can eliminate fear is by encountering one another as human beings. Um, and that's that's why we have a Ramadan dinner at our place, and that's why we had the upstate warriors there, and that's that's why we're doing what we're doing is so that we can sit down together and, and sit face to face <laughs> and realize that, um, that these are folks that have the same issues, the same worries, the same concerns that, that we have, and they're not different. They're, they believe in a little different way, yes, but um, they're, they're humans and uh, they're loving. So, I'll turn that to you. Rabbi, sure. you're sure. next. I'm next. Um, well, I mean, the first thing, um, for, for, the, for the most part, most uh, American Jews that fall into Reform and Conservative Judaism, but not, I'm talking about not the ultra-Orthodox, uh, fall very, very liberally, mm -hmm. um, politically and, and from a human standpoint. Um, for the, the vast majority of my congregation, I, mean, I, have a, I have a handful that are far to the right, that gentleman included, that I mentioned, that I, that I said. But the bottom line is God is God. No matter what name we choose to give her or him, um, and God is just fine. And when we think that we need to defend God, we got it backwards. God is here to protect us, not the other way around. And Great we point. think we're protecting God. What we're really protecting is our dogma. We're really protecting our religion, and then we're worshiping our religion, not God, and that's idol worship. And all of our Very religions good point. forbid that across the board, and that's exactly what it becomes. Um, the more I've spent time with, um, especially with the with the, with the Ape Table of Abraham that, that uh, Keith and Christine had put together, the more I sat down and I spoke with my Muslim brothers and sisters, I found out that Christianity aside, Jews and Muslims are so much closer than Jews and Christians or Christians and Muslims. Uh, our faiths are just remarkable. We sit together going, really? Really? You call it that too? It's the same words, slightly different accent, because Hebrew and Arabic are very, very similar religions. Um, the more that we can point this out, the more that we can realize that we're just the same. On a, on a practical level, and, and I do mention this to my congregants on a regular basis, the Torah says 36 times to be kind to the stranger. We know the heart of the stranger. We know the heart of the oppressed more than most people on the face of the earth. And because of that, it gives us an extra chiyuv, uh, an extra responsibility to make sure that nobody feels that. Uh, we have Passover coming up in a couple of weeks, and one of the things that we say is we are not free until everybody is free, until the world is free, until oppression is blotted out. Nobody is free from oppression. Um, and the final thing I wanted to say about that is a practical note in America, and I mentioned this to Daisy, right now the climate in America, the, the hatred and the racism and the calling out of people, uh, the bottom line is right now, if you are not a straight, white, wealthy, Protestant man in America, you are under attack. And while the Jews might not necessarily feel that we're under attack, if history has told us anything, when they get done with the Muslims, they're going to move on to us. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, that's they have all the time. No, so so that means if we're not standing up for them, we're really not standing up for ourselves because that's just how the world works. So um, there you go. I'm done. For now. Please. Uh, what I would like to recommend is uh, to open first of all. Definitely, we have to be open-minded, right, and open ourselves. But the, the second step will be open your homes, uh, to invite others to your home. That is the most sacred and private place that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. This is where we have all our privacy. And then once you share your home with someone else, to open your doors and invite them to share a meal together. Or invite for coffee if you cannot cook well. <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's, I would say, definitely find someone, belong to the other community or page group, and make an invitation. That will make a huge change. Okay, and we're gonna um, we're gonna open up the the floor for questions. If any of you um, have have any questions, um, but one thing that I one thing that I would love to to mention, um, and that and I I would love to to highlight because um, because I think that this is something that's really important, and it's 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 not a point of contention, but I consider I think that a lot of the reason why we have a lot of this dissension when we have a lot of this hatred. I think it's because people are erroneously putting together religion and politics, which is not the way that it's supposed to be. Um, and for me, I consider myself a conservative Christian. I do. And, but I consider myself conservative when it comes to finance and economics and all these kinds of things. But I absolutely understand and agree with everything that you're saying. Everything. And that's what I see. I think that people are using the conflict to confuse people about what's really going on. And I think that people are taking advantage um, of the power struggle you know, that, that exists right now. And I think that's really unfortunate because it's just creating hate that doesn't need to be there. It's not there. I think that it's manufactured. I think it's false perspectives. but. Maybe that's just me. I love everyone, um, and I want everyone to be able to thrive because that is our that is our right. That is, that is our right as as human beings. We are each one of us, as you were saying before. We're all dignified, and should be given the right to live freely, and without persecution. So, um, anyhow, that's my two cents, and I appreciate you listening. Um, want to open up the floor now for questions for our panelists? Do we have a second microphone there that can be okay? Great. And if you could just uh, make sure that you dress, let who you're... Yeah, I just want to make a brief remark, okay. then I got a question. But it reminds me very much of uh, an old friend of mine uh, who uh, I, I knew for 10 years in Germany. He was from Iran, for, first name Hussein, and of course he was a Shiite, and we got into discussion about terrorism, especially we talked about the uh, terrorist attack in, in Munich at the Munich uh, mm. uh, uh, Olympic Games and so forth, and we got in a uh, discussion, how does it work, how is religion responsible in a way for these attacks? Why is always religion mentioned when hate and, and it comes out, yes. uh, and when, when hate breaks out and people kill each other? And uh, how to stop it? And we, we agreed that the churches on both sides are not doing their job. Number one is what, what, what he said, for example, uh, oh, we first had a discussion about the aggressiveness of Muslims, and he asked me, when you look back the last 500 years, how many Muslims have been invading the United States and Europe? And how many invasions have been there from the European side in Muslim states? I, uh, Good point. We, I had to stop that discussion because I had no arguments. <laughs> right. <laughs> But uh, it is true, it, the question was, and what we really couldn't answer, that what still bothers me today, is if both religions are on peace, understanding, and non-violence, but there are wars, how can priests and mullahs or whatever give blessing to troops which go out to kill each other? Mm. And why do those priests still believe they are religious, they are with God, or Allah is their friend, and they are doing the right thing. That was the question nobody of us could answer, and we hope it would change in a, in a way, and uh, it hasn't changed till 1980. You being married to an imam, I'm sure you've got a great perspective on that. Um, <clears throat> so religion has been co-opted and used for centuries by people for political gain. And a lot of these groups are political groups who know that by casting themselves as religious, that they will be able to bring, rally more people mm -hmm. to them. So um, right now we are seeing a genocide taking place in Myanmar. And there's a Buddhist monk behind it. Can you imagine? We think of Buddhists as floating on lotuses. Right? <laughs> we always think that Buddhists are only floating on lotuses. Well, some Buddhist monk has created his own and he's being aided and abetted by the government or the military 
and they are giving him all the arsenal because they want him to do their bidding. Mm. They want to cleanse the nation, get the Rohingya out, who have lived there for hundreds of years, and do it in the name of Buddhism. I know this for a fact because we have a Buddhist monk friend who's from Burma, who's very upset and doesn't know what to do. And finally, you know, he's able to identify with Muslims because he's like, you know, I always used to say, why aren't Muslims speaking out? And now I look at him and I said, why aren't Buddhists speaking out? So this is happening in all religions. It's happening in India with the Hindus. It's happening. What people have to do, of people of good conscience, they have to step forward. And they have to say, no, not in the name of my religion. Yep. Our effort to do this is the first effort because Muslims are really being confronted with not only an, an internal enemy, but we are also then, as a result of that, being confronted by an external you know, uh, pressures. So we felt the pressure, and that's why we stepped forward and said, we're taking a lead. I'm hoping that other religions will do the same. Because I have people in New York that are telling me, we need to do this for Christianity. We have Jewish friends that are telling us, we need to do this for Judaism, because you have to separate these religions, the truth of these religions, from this falsehood that is being couched as religion that propels people. Uh, and now you have social media that people are using and information is getting spread so fast. And, and this is why you're seeing the proliferation of this, of this ideology. Excellent point. It's, a, it's the same issue as like the, the post for during the last pope, uh, the pope during World War II. Why didn't he step in and forbid Catholics to, to use violence all over the all over Europe? Mm -hmm. He didn't do it. I have not, I've not heard of any mullah or very high-ranking Muslim leader yet to say you are not going to heaven when you kill innocent people. When you go to Jerusalem or wherever in the world and blow the world in a box. But you don't hear that here in the United States. Yeah. He's talking about it's not disseminated so, so on a wide. answer to that. Yeah. And the answer is the media doesn't cover us. Right. So we did a summit where 350 people came. Marissa was there. And I called all the media. I said, this is the biggest response the Muslims are doing. 72 voices. We are making a clear demarcation. This is not our religion. And please come. Everybody said, we're doing political reporting right now. We have Donald Trump. He's doing this tomorrow, that tomorrow. And no one covered us. A fly. That's why on the website you have 1,400 condemnations. Go ahead. You don't even have to pay for anything. You just have to click download, and you will see what the world Muslim community is saying. All the leaders are saying. They are rejecting it. There are fatwas issued against this group. And it just doesn't get the coverage. That's may the problem. I add something? Yeah. Of course. Just a, a brief response I want to add to that. Uh, and I want to applaud you because you um, you were very honest about something a little bit earlier. I don't even know if, if you realize what, what it was. Um, I've sat in panels like this before, and we've all talked about, oh, how peaceful our religions are, how peaceful our religions are. But the fact of the matter is all of our religions have violent pasts. All of our religions have violent verses in our scripture. And we, until we're honest about that, and we say, all right, there's a context. That was then, Context. this is now. 100%. And until we're, we're willing to say that, yes, part of our, I mean, read the book of Samuel, and mm -hmm. you're told to completely eradicate and prescribe a people. Right. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Maybe we did it then, I don't know. And, and Islam as well has a history, you know, somebody once said, well, we brought peace to Arabia. Well, yeah, but there was an awful lot of conquering that was part of that peace. So if we can be honest about that, the Crusades as well. Let's face it, they're heading to the Middle East to, 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 to rid it of the infidel, and on the way they say, oh, wait a minute, we got infidels right here along the way. Let's practice on the Jews on our way. Um, but until we acknowledge that, that yes, it's part of our religion, but as religious leaders, it, it's our obligation to point out that this is something that might be part of our tradition. We can't take a scissor to the Torah. Um, but I can say these parts we lovingly and respectively say, part of our history, not part of our present, not part of our future. Great point. I do want to add something that is really important. In the United States, slavery was aided and abetted by the church. There are some black people in this audience here, my friends. Nobody challenged it. For centuries, it went on unchallenged. And Muslims, who were brought along, who were considered to be heathen and infidels, that they had to be converted. That was a justification for it. Until women 
moved forward. And this is a woman's moment, ladies and gentlemen. Until these women with a conscience, faith-based women, black and white together, the suffragettes said, no, not in our name, not in the name of our Lord, and not in the name of our scripture. And they were the ones who stepped forward. They had many men that were supporting them. And now today we are hearing about suffragettes coming forward and obituaries being reprinted. And, mm -hmm. but, but, but somebody has to step, has to take the first step. There are wonderful people of good conscience, but it requires a critical mass of people to rise up together. And eventually, you know, slavery ended. Uh, but it took the guts of women to step forward and say, why should my Negro um, person who is serving me, this wonderful person, be enslaved? Because they felt that. They felt the bondage wasn't right. And they couldn't find it in their scriptures. So it's the same thing. We've done things in the name of our religion because the status quo is beneficial to us. And, and, and this has to stop. And this has to stop and religions have to speak up because the crime in the name of religion is a crime against religion. Yes. Great point. Wonderful point. Next. Uh, to see that this works. Uh, I actually have an interesting story that might be of interest. I work internationally. Uh, I work internationally in Djibouti, which is a Muslim country. Uh, so I work internationally in a, in a Muslim country, Djibouti, uh, doing relief work. And I ended up with the Djibouti army officers took me to a school. They said, we want to help this school because it's helping Somali refugee children. So I said, that's great. And so I went there and they said, but it's run by a Catholic priest. I went, oh. I said, let me just say, before anything, our organization cannot help any organization that is trying to convert children. So here is this American Jewish Buddhist talking to these Muslim military officers about a Catholic priest. who, when I met him, was the most beautiful soul I ever met and ended up having a great thing. And so we ended up working together, all these religions working together to help children without changing them in any way, but changing them for the good of like helping them to have food and education. So I just want to say that there is hope for the world. Yeah, great. I don't know why this was, this was on, but it wasn't working. Um, it's, it's interesting because I think that like a lot of what I'm hearing here is that you've got goodness on one side and then you've got evil on the other side. And you know every 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 group, every religion, every sect, if you would, they've all got they've all got the both sides. But like you were saying, Rabbi, it's like we have to st we have to speak up. We have to say it's not that's that's not the way that we want to live. And I love your 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 book, Wise Up, because it goes through and it really clarifies those misconceptions. To where when you really become intelligent, you know, and, and, and you know the information, you're like, mm, no, that's not the truth. Because everyone can try to sow um, ignorance and, sow, and, and, and that produces fear, which then produces hatred. And so that's, I think, what we're trying to avoid. But if you're someone in power and you've got this wonderful tool that works at, the, at, at your fingertips, you're going to use it. And so I think that, but I think that, 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 that people in numbers are more powerful. Yeah. And that if we can come together, we can, we can overcome that. And I especially want that for, for the upstate as we're growing, to make sure that we grow in a healthy way to where everyone is represented yeah. so we can avoid some of those problems. Yeah. First of all, I really appreciate your separation of theology from ideology. I think that's something that everyone needs to really push or pull or whatever the marketing term is, because I think a lot of people confuse those two. Here's what I've heard serving on the Interfaith Forum Board, and I talk to people of all types of faith or non-faith, and it is exactly encountering other people. Some people are afraid to encounter the Islamic person Muslim person, because there's this mind virus or this meme going around that says, hey, if you even look a little weird at them or say something a little off or whatever, they're going to report you to the sheriff or chief military. And so 
this is uh, something that is sort of like in the back of their head. Like, you know, this guy sort of looking at it. And, and my experience, and I have Muslim friends, I have not come across that at all. And so it's very similar in respect to bullying, because what happens in bullying is it's a similar type situation, and then the person being bullied doesn't stand up for themselves because they sort of say, oh, it won't happen again, or, or whatever. So I'm trying to get some perspective on what's the solution to that, because I think that that is a mind virus or a meme that's going around that is perpetuating, maybe even in our schools, and can be extended also towards bullying. And that's why religious leaders are so important, is because they influence their constituencies and their communities and their congregations, and it's really important to get to them. That's why we're making an effort to reach through the Wise Up book. People can privately read this on their own and come to their own conclusions. I was in the green room once, we were about to go on CNN, and Mr. Franklin Graham was right next to me. We were supposed to be on the same show. In the privacy of our room, he looked at me and he said, I just want you to know I don't believe a word of your religion. It's a wicked religion. But I love Muslims. And he did not know that I have gone to Catholic school for 11 years. And I was taught by the most devout nuns, Irish nuns. And so I looked at him and I said, I just want you to know, Rabbi Graham, I've done the Lord's Prayer 3,000 times in my life, and the, the teachings of Jesus are not your teachings, or you're not teaching what Jesus taught. I think he was stunned. It changed everything. Of course, then he went on national TV and repeated that. I mean, you can download it. It's Christiana Manpour, Daisy Khan, download it. You'll see what he says. He says it on national TV. Now, all his people that are his followers, they will believe what he says. So unless we get to him, and we transform him, we're not going to be able to get to the poor souls that he's, uh, uh, you know. He just said it at his father's funeral. He said, people say there are many paths to God, it's all wrong, there's only one path to God. It's a national TV with all the heads of state sitting there. So, so we have to change the hearts and minds of those people, but until then, we just do these kinds of forums where individuals like you come and you spread the gospel yourself. The true gospel. We could go on and talk about this for hours and hours. <laughs> well, at least we we have begun the conversation, and just want to thank you all for being here and, and sharing your experiences and and your perspectives with us. I want to now um, invite Daisy to say a little bit about these awards that we're about to to give out um, that recognize upstate upstate interfaith heroes. So part of what we had in, in the Wise Up, if you buy the Wise Up book today, in the back you will see profiles of many heroes. Contemporary heroes, ancient heroes, because we really want people to get inspired by those people who go over and above the call of duty and who have changed you know, societies and who have, well, anyhow. So we've profiled about 30 wonderful heroes, but we also profiled heroic initiatives, individuals here in America. So we have 10 profiles of interfaith organizations that you know, really went out and tried to support Muslims, and then we have 10 uh, Muslims who have uh, done a lot of work in the community to safeguard others. Um, so part of what our town hall dialogues does is we identify local heroes because we know that the people that we have in the books we culled from the folks that we knew, but there are local heroes in every community who are doing extraordinary work, and we need to highlight them, and we need to applaud them, and we need to congratulate them, and we need other people to know about them. So this is why we are giving these awards to the, our local heroes here today. So we'd like to invite our first hero, up to the sta stage. Is Mark Wilson, uh, Rabbi Mark Wilson here? Okay, please, if you can please accept this award. And who is going to say a little word, a few words about it? Go ahead. Rabbi Mark Wilson moved to the Greenville area from, Ch from Chicago close to 20 years ago and has constantly been a force of altruism and interfaith dialogue in the upstate. 
From his time as the rabbi of Congregation Beth Israel to his frequent community outreach and service, Rabbi Wilson continues to do good for the upstate. He has delivered keynote addresses at both Clemson and Furman Universities, as well as serving on the Mayor's Religious Advisory Committee, the Bioethics Resource Group, Hospital Clinical Review Committees, and Clinical Pastoral Education Programs. He is a prolific writer, being published in Reader's Digest, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, as well as being a weekly columnist for the Columbia State. He is the founder of Meeting Point, which promotes interfaith equality and dialogue through the year of altruism. This program features diverse religious scholars to help further intercultural education and altruistic behavior among many different backgrounds. He was named Community Servant of the Year by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and named one of the 40 best reasons to stay in the Palmetto State by Southern Living Magazine. Very impressive. Thank you. And he just told me to be brief. I, I, I'm just going to say that I, I am proud to call him my friend, my colleague, my teacher. Uh, and uh, the quote on here is from Pirkei Avot, which is the wisdom of our ancestors, uh, probably second century before the Common Era. Hello, Omre Ahave, Mital Midav, Shal Aharon, Ohev Shalom, Verodef Shalom, be as the disciples of Aaron, loving peace and pursuing peace. And that is Rabbi Wilson. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, the next is Ro'an Abdul 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 Okay, Youth Interfeet Greenville. Wow, a Muslim woman. How exciting is that? So Ro'an Abdul Abdul is a senior at Greenville Technical Charter High School. She exemplifies a forward-thinking student with a bright future, and she's beautiful as well. Rowan is the founder and executive director of Youth Interfaith, which brings high school and college students together and promotes interreligious understanding. Rowan has also been the, been the impetus of several community-driven programs. She initiated a Syrian refugee clothing drive, started the Red Cross Club at her school, and has been the South Carolina state champion in extemporaneous speaking. Wow. Her skills as a public speaker have allowed her to spread her message of cultural and religious understanding to many young people and students. Her desire to ensure that culture and religion should not be conflated helps dispel incorrect assumptions or judgments that many people have. She will be majoring in public health so that she can make her unique, take her unique approach to interfaith collaboration to the next step. To this end, Rowan has already helped train more than 400 students in CPR with the Students in Action team that she helped to create. Her focus on community, health, and understanding makes her a strong leader with a unique, varied skill set. So I want to personally thank her because this is like the project, you know, these are the people that I'm looking for in our community. But not just that, many years ago when I began my work, uh, people said, what about Muslim women? Aren't you oppressed and suppressed? And that was one of the motivations why I had to step in. And so, these young people are, you know, uh, writing on the legacy of not only American activism, but also on the activism of the early women from 7th century. So I applaud you. So please say a few words. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone very much for this opportunity. And it's really an honor to be included among these very uh, accomplished leaders in my community. And I think that one of the most important things for everyone to take away today is to also to remember to include the younger voices because we really do have an extremely active younger generation in Greenville. And by including their voices in things like this event and in other efforts across the community, we can truly ensure that the future generation of this country strongly believes in values like interfaith dialogue and collaboration. And that way you can feel confident leaving the world in good hands. Next is Nidal Mefla from Islamic Society of Clemson. So Nidal Mefla was born in Jerusalem, Israel. In 1977, he moved to the United States to further his education. After completing his master's, Nidal joined the United States Air Force where he served for 22 honorable years. After retiring from the military, Nidal moved to South Carolina where he worked as a teacher 
with the Oconee County School System until moving to his current job at the Oconee Nuclear Station with Compass Group USA. Nadell serves as the president of the Islamic Community of Clemson, where he diligently works to educate and service the Muslim community, as well as promoting interfaith dialogue across the upstate. As part of his interfaith community service, Nadell has participated in a week-long interfaith forum with the Presbyterian Church in Seneca, hosted confirmation classes for St. Mark United Methodist Church with the Islamic Center, and hosted religion students from Clemson University at the Clemson Mosque with the goal of letting people of various cultures interact. Wise hero. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, giving us this opportunity for Daisy, um, Brother Akif, and the organization for uh, the Atlantic Institute. I always believe in communication. Uh, everybody who knows me, I have a lot of faces here that knows me. Communication is the bridges that we build to understand one another. A lot of people who refuse to do that or refuse to give the other people the opportunity to talk and to explain themselves or to explain their way of life and religion. But like we said here, it starts with the religious leaders because these people are like a sword with two edges. They can kill people while they're educating others. So that's why I always believe, and I know Steve is one of the, my idol for talking. Peter is a lot of the people who always I look up to and they always do good work, it doesn't matter for the Islamic community, Jewish or Christian or others. I appreciate all your work and everybody else. Thank you so much. Father Patrick Tuttle from St. Anthony of Padua Catholic Church. I am not Father Patrick. Oh, no, you're not Father Tuttle. But I'm honored to stand. So on behalf of, I guess, Father Tuttle, I would like to offer Father Tuttle his award as a wise hero. If I could just say a word of just what an honor it is to stand for him and all his commitment to the disadvantaged, to persons discriminated against in any way. You hear his name again and again and again, and he's just such a beautiful presence. So thank you. I'm sorry, we didn't hear the yes, description. Okay. No worries. Well, we'll take, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Father Tuttle, so if you ever see him around, you can say, man, you're amazing. Um, <laughs> Father Patrick Tuttle has served as pastor of St. Anthony of Padua Church in Greenville for over a decade. In this time, he has helped the St. Anthony's Church flourish, growing the church to over 10 times the members from when he joined on as a priest. Father Tuttle is a champion of intercultural acceptance and understanding, bringing a unique approach to religious education. The school at St. Anthony's, Anthony's Padua Church helps bring education to the community and seeks to aid those who are less fortunate, regardless of their religious background. Father Tuttle's efforts helped to modernize the school in 2013, which continues to drive graduation rates up in Greenville County. Father Tuttle has also been an important part of securing a trust fund from Greenville City Council to help lower income families find important parts of, uh, of keeping affordable housing. In addition, Father Tuttle spearheaded efforts to convince the state of South Carolina to change their policy on accepting refugees. Father Tuttle's approach to education, interreligious collaboration, and improving the county around him makes him a boon to the upstate. He does everything he can, he can to, as he puts in his own words, quote, bring beauty and order back in the world. <laughs> Reverend Darian Blue, the Phyllis Wheatley Center and Nicoltown Missionary Baptist Church. And I've heard that once you give a mic to the Baptist, they <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Darian Blue here moved to Greenville from Gainesville, Florida in 2011. Since 2012, uh, Reverend Blue has served as the senior pastor of the Nicoltown Missionary Baptist Church, where he and his congregation have made many positive impacts in the upstate. He currently is a member of several committees dedicated to education and community service, 
Since 2013, he sits as the executive director of the Phyllis Wheatley Center, where his bold and ambitious actions have served the community well. His efforts aid the under, under, undeserved and unfortunate, helping turn people into productive citizens of the upstate. For his work, he has earned several awards and recognitions, including being named in the top 10 talented youth professionals in Greenville, the Community Man of the Year Award, the prestigious Calder B. Airman Outstanding Individual Award in Diversity and Inclusion, as well as being featured in USA Today for his efforts to eliminate poverty and being selected by Greenville Business Magazine as one of the most 50 most in, um, sorry, as one of the 50 most influential for 2017. Just really brief, um, thank you so very much. I, I'm so honored to be here and, and to be in your presence. I've heard you speak on television and I followed you, so thank you for your words. It really touched me deep. And just really quick, I live by this, I die by this, that God is love. Thank you. And the final honoree is Dr. Peter Cohen. Dr. Peter Cohen came to Greenville in 1995 to teach at Clemson University as senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Religion. In his teachings, he distinctly explores the similarities of various religions rather than their differences and helps promote interfaith dialogue and education while serving as a board member for the Atlantic Institute. Dr. Cohen has served as the Clemson University faculty advisor for the Hillel Jewish Student Organization, as well as serving with the Interfaith Forum of the Upstate. His efforts to shine a light on how similar the religions of the world are lead him to speak at many engagements, forums, panels, and events where the focus, on interfaith and inter where the focus is on interfaith and intercultural education. He has chaperoned several trips to foreign countries to guide young students through international travel as well. His efforts has, have helped to redefine the word interfaith and have opened many doors to understanding. Just a few thoughts. First of all, thank you so much to all the organizations um, for all the work you do. One thing you didn't mention in your work is that all of us, all of the religious leaders, need to make sure that their congregants understand their own religion. Uh, read the holy books, because this is a problem we have. I always ask my students, for instance, you know, how many of you who are non-Muslim have read the Quran? And I get one hand, maybe. Um, the other thing I definitely want to mention is, um, I guess words that I go by these days, um, forget about toleration. Okay, we've been tolerating our neighbors for too long. We need to accept them as human beings. We need to accept who they are, what they stand for. We may not agree with them. We may not embrace them, but we have to understand them by accepting what they feel and what they have to say. And if we can do that, then dialogue can take place. And thank you for all the work you do. Thank you, Professor. I know I spent some time with him today, and he's doing amazing work, and he's teaching religion, and so he speaks intimately from, from that experience. Uh, so I think that um, this is the plug. In case you want to go home with a book today, and, um, but apparently we can't do any purchase out there and you can only do it online. Uh, so if you want to contact us, this is the way that you contact us. You can just take a picture of the screen if you feel and, 
And I just want to say thank you very much for coming. I know that um, you have other commitments, so I really appreciate taking the time out of your schedule to be here today. And this is my first trip to Greenville. And uh, I was like, I was a little surprised. Why haven't I come to this place before? It's the easiest flight. It's beautiful weather. You have this fantastic, you know, uh, falls here. Lovely bridge, so I will be coming back if you will have me. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate it. I hope that you all will have, I hope you all have gained a lot of knowledge that you have, um, have made, hopefully, some new friends, um, and, uh, and that you will take all of us and Daisy especially up on the offer to really be forces for change for good in your communities and acceptance so that we can all live together in peace the way that we should be living. So thank you so much again for being here. Thank you.